Take your Bibles and turn to the book of Exodus, Exodus chapter 4, as Brother Joe mentioned in the prayer time, is where we're going to be this morning. Like many of the messages coming up in our series, we're going to be covering a larger section of Scripture. As I laid out back in November, the preaching calendar for 2024, trying to fit in all of Exodus in a 12-month span, well, I had to consolidate some larger sections in order for it to all fit And so this week, we're going to look at the whole chapter four. Next week, we're going to look at three chapters. The week after that, we're going to look at five chapters. And so you're going to need this morning, actually, a Bible open in your lap because of the length. We didn't have room on the half sheet outline to print all the the text for this morning. So you want to make sure you have a Bible open in front of you. If you didn't bring a Bible, you can grab a pew Bible in front of you and turn to page 47 in that Bible. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever been approaching a particular situation or experience and maybe it's your personal pessimism or maybe you just consider yourself a realist and you think this is not going to turn out well? I just know, I know the situation, I know people, I know human nature, this is not going to turn out well, it's doomed from the start. And then maybe, perhaps, by the grace of God, you were wrong. It turns out better than you could have ever imagined or dreamed or expected. Well, if you've ever been in that kind of mental state where you're like, this is just not going to end well, well, you're starting to understand a bit of the the mental space that Moses is occupying as we come here to chapter 4 of the book of Exodus. I want to draw out the perimeters of this whole chapter right on the onset so we can see what happens And then we'll consider the intervening verses between. Look on the screen or in your Bible at the first verse and the last verse of the chapter. Verse 1 says this, Then Moses answered, But behold, they will not believe me. Negative Nelly, right? I mean, that's the pessimistic attitude. And then look how the chapter concludes. And the people believed. Moses couldn't have been more wrong. He thought there's no way the people are going to believe me. They're not going to listen to me. And then what we'll see today is in the intervening verses, Moses actually puts forward not one, not two, but three excuses why he doesn't believe the people will listen. For those who have not been with us in this series, here's the context of this passage We're right in the middle of the conversation that Moses has with the Lord at the burning bush. Now, we've identified a couple weeks ago, we saw that the voice that's coming from the burning bush is none other than the second person of the Trinity, the Lord Jesus Christ. This is known as a Christophany. It's a visible manifestation. It's an appearance of Jesus before the incarnation. And so Jesus is speaking to Moses, and Jesus is giving Moses specific instructions to go to the Hebrew people to deliver them from the captivity they are in in Egypt. And Moses begins with a couple of questions. The first question was this, if you'll remember, who am I? (laughs) Who am I to do such a job? The second question we considered last week was, God, who are you? Who are you that I should tell the people has sent me to them? So we considered two weeks ago the who am I question, and here's how God answered the who am I question that Moses presented. I'll tell you who you are, Moses. You're the guy who's going to have my presence upon him. This is who you are, Moses. You're going to have my power working through you. That's the who am I question. Then last week, we considered his second question, God, who are you? Who should I tell the leaders of Israel? Who should I tell the people has sent me? And in chapter 3 of Exodus, for the very first time in human history, God revealed his personal name. He had not revealed his personal name to any other human before this event at the burning bush. His personal name, this is who you tell them has sent you, Moses. I am who I am. Shorten it, the personal name, Yahweh. What does that name mean? What does I am mean? It's the verb to be. What is he communicating? God is the self-existent one. He needs no one. He needs no thing to be, to function, to do. So you go tell them, Moses, here's the answer to the question. Who should I say sent me? I am. The great I am is sending you. Well, following God's self-revelation 
to Moses through the burning bush, I am who I am, Moses apparently is still not convinced. And here we see, again, in this passage, he will put forward three excuses. Now, at the end of chapter three, we saw last week, God gave Moses seven predictions, seven promises. This is how you will know I'm with you. But even at that, apparently those convincing proofs were not enough to convince Moses. So we're going to consider the, um, the three excuses that Moses raises. We'll consider how God answers those excuses specifically. And then we'll look at the concluding verses, just a real quick flyover, so we can go to the end of chapter three and where we'll be, Lord willing, next week. So let's get to work. Here's excuse number one, and that is Moses pronounced the skepticism of his mind. Moses expresses his personal skepticism. In his mind, he believed there's no way the people are going to listen to me. He was skeptical. There's no way they're going to believe me. Look again at verse 1. Moses answered, but behold, they will not believe me or listen to my voice, for they will say, the Lord did not appear to you. I want you to notice what's happening here. This excuse that Moses puts forward where he doubts the people's willingness to believe him, friends, it's not so much that Moses is doubting the people as much as Moses is doubting God. God's already given him convincing proofs. God's already given him evidence. He's speaking from a burning bush that is not being consumed by the fire. He's already pro proclaimed his powerful might. Two things he mentions. They're not going to believe me. They're not going to listen to my voice. On the surface, that may sound like humility, like self-abasement. Aw, shucks, who am I? They're not going to listen to me. But really, it's pride. It's pride in thinking God's not going to do the work through him. He's expressing his own unbelief. The bigger issue here is not Moses' doubt of the people, but Moses' doubt in God. He's skeptical of the very word of God accomplishing the power for which it's being sent to accomplish. Now, what I'm about to say is not in any way to defend Moses, but can you understand his point of view maybe a little bit? God, they're not going to listen to me. Can, can you s sympathize with him maybe just a smidge? Maybe you have some people in your circle of relationships that are difficult people, staunch skeptics, unbelievers, perhaps even self-proclaimed atheists. These people are too lost, too hard, too set in their ways to ever believe in God. And so maybe you can identify with Moses on some level here. There's no way they're going to believe. Let me tell you, I'm your pastor. It's my profession to proclaim to you the word of God. Honest confession, there are times in my study when I sense the Lord is saying something and I tell myself, there's no way they'll believe that. This is too hard. This is too strong. They're not going to follow this. And quite frankly, I don't believe that you will believe it. But what am I really expressing? Doubt in you or doubt in the power of God's word? And so because I don't believe it, maybe I modify it, I change it, I water it down, I make it more palatable. So that's Moses' first excuse. They're never going to listen. They're not going to believe. He's skeptical, not so much in them as much as he is in the power of the word of God. And I want you to notice how God answers his first excuse. God's answer is this, powerful signs. God presents to Moses three powerful signs which will authenticate to Moses that they will, in fact, believe you are speaking for me. Look as we read verses two through five. The Lord, that's Yahweh, said to him, what is that in your hand? He said, a staff. And he said, throw it on the ground. So he threw it on the ground and it became a serpent and Moses ran from it. Smart guy. Verse four, but the Lord said to Moses, Put out your hand and catch it by the tail. 
So he put out his hand and caught it, and it became a staff in his hand, that they may believe that the Lord, the God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, has appeared to you. So Moses has this staff in his hand. Now I want to say, I want to say a couple of things about a staff. Throughout human history, a staff has actually been a symbol of authority or of power. If you may remember the coronation of King Charles last year, here's the official coronation portrait. Doesn't he look regal? He's holding a staff because a staff represents authority. It represents power. But what about with Moses? Moses isn't royalty. He's a shepherd. But what does a staff do for a shepherd? Well, it was a very important implement for being a shepherd. With a staff, he guided his flock where they needed to go. With a staff, he protected his flock from predators, maybe even from cobras. With a staff, as he's walking the rugged terrain of the Sinai region, it's keeping him afoot. Staff is a very important instrument for a shepherd. And God tells Moses to take this common stick and throw it to the ground. And what happens? It turns into a snake. I think a cobra, likely. Certainly it was a venomous snake. That's why he turned and ran in the opposite direction. You see, Moses would have been very familiar with venomous snakes that existed in that region around the Mount Sinai area. Moses would have also been very familiar with the symbolism of a cobra. In Egyptian folklore, in Egyptian culture and belief, the cobra was a symbol of power, so much so that the pharaohs actually had a cobra on their headdress. You look at the excavated tombs of mummies of pharaohs, you will see the golden headdress or the covering, the helmet that has a cobra right on it. What is God saying here by turning the staff into a snake and then demonstrating his power over it by turning it back into a stick again. God is saying, I have power even over the greatest power of Egypt. My power is greater. You know, in the same way that Moses was initially afraid of the serpent and ran in the opposite direction, he was afraid of the power of Egypt. 40 years earlier, when his life was being threatened by Pharaoh, by Egypt, what did he do? He ran in the opposite direction of the power of Egypt represented by the cobra. And now God's power would be with him to go back. Anybody here ever caught a snake before? Raise your hand. Be, be bold. Growing up on a farm, I used to catch snakes all the time. Non-venomous, by the way. If you know what I know the difference between a venomous snake and a non-venomous snake out here in the southeast, uh, everything except for a coral snake has cat-like eyes that are venomous. The pupils that are round, those are non-venomous except a coral snake. So next time you see a snake, just get real close to it, look at his eyeballs <laughs> to find out if it's venomous or non-venomous. I caught a lot of snakes growing up as a kid. I even caught one, in, I don't know, a year ago or so that was in the yard. Ah, I'll catch a snake. Any herptologist will tell you, that's people who study snakes, you don't catch a snake by the tail. It annoys them. It also gives them greater opportunity to come around and bite you. When I catch snakes, I catch them right, between the, right behind the head, right? So they can't bite me. And God tells Moses, go catch that cobra and catch it by the tail, right? So Moses is exhibiting some level of faith here, but he catches it and it turns right back into a stick. Again, it is not Moses' cunning or capacity that is going to overcome the power of Egypt it is the power of God. This was a lesson for Moses, and friends, it's a lesson for us. If God can use a stick, God can use Moses. If God can use a stick, God can use you. His power is greater. Further, in verse 5, God promises that this sign of the staff turning into the serpent will actually communicate to the people that Moses represents the covenantal God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I think perhaps what this means is they were aware of the promise of the covenant that God made not only with Abraham, but with Adam and Eve. What was the promise? That this God would crush 
the cobra. This God would crush the head of the serpent. But in case this first sign that God demonstrates to Moses is not enough, the stick turning into a snake and then back to a stick again, God then in his grace gives Moses a second sign, a second miracle. Look at verse six. Again, the Lord said to him, put your hand inside your cloak. And he put his hand inside his cloak. And when he took it out, behold, his hand was leprous like snow. Then God said, put your hand back inside your cloak. So he put it back, his hand back inside his cloak. And when he took it out, behold, it was restored like the rest of his flesh. If they will not believe you, God said, or listen to the first sign, they may believe the latter sign. So I think this first sign of the staff to a snake represents God's power over the power of Egypt. I think this second sign represents God's power over the health of Egypt, over the physical capacity of Egypt. Here's just a preview of three of the 10 plagues we'll consider in a couple of weeks. Three of those 10 plagues had to do with health. The first uh, one I'd consider is the fifth plague, which has to do with the health of the livestock. There will be livestock that are just gonna be dropping dead. You move to plague number six, it's the plague of the sickness through boils and sores. In fact, the text says that the boils were so severe on the people that even Pharaoh's magicians couldn't stand before Moses. I think they couldn't stand before him because they had boils on the soles of their feet. They were affected and infected with these boils. And then, of course, the tenth plague has to do with physical health in that the firstborn of every household in Egypt would be killed. And so here, God says, guess what? I have power, I have authority, even over man's health. But I want you to think about, if you're Moses, you stick your hand in your cloak, and you pull it out, and it is covered with an incurable disease. I mean, the first sign, at least that's disconnected from him. Oh, serpent. The second sign, he's infected with a disease that has no known cure in that time and space. It's connected to them. You know, throughout the Bible, leprosy and sickness in general is used as a metaphor to describe the sickness of the human heart. Let me show you a couple of examples. David said in Psalm 38, there is no soundness in my flesh because of your indignation. There is no health in my bones. Why? Because of my sin. And then Jeremiah famously said in Jeremiah 17, 9, 9, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. It's unhealthy. It's unwell. Friends, just as it took the power of God to display to Moses that he had this leprous infection in his hand, it also requires the power of God to reveal to our minds and our hearts just how sin sick we actually are. See, people don't actually see their own mortality, their own wickedness, their own sinfulness. Here's the mantra of our day. Follow your heart. Just do what feels good. Do what you think is right. Do what's true for you. And the Bible says your heart is desperately sick. It's leprous to the core. Follow your heart? Yeah, follow it all the way to the grave. And so it takes, it requires, for in supernatural insight from God for us to be able to even see our own sinfulness. There's nothing, it's incurable. There's nothing we can do or any other human being can do to heal the sickness that we have. And so God says, Put your hand back in your cloak. And I'm sure it was quite a relief when he pulled it out and it's whole again. Moses experiences this healing. That's the second miraculous sign that God gives. That leads to the third miraculous sign. Notice it in verse 9. Answer to this first excuse. They won't believe me. They won't listen. Verse 9. Eve, if they will not believe even these two signs or listen to your voice, here's what you do. You shall take some water from the Nile and pour it on the dry ground. And the water that you shall take from the Nile will become blood on the dry ground. Now, unlike the first two miracles, God didn't demonstrate this one. God demonstrated the first two. A stick turned into a snake, hand turned leprous. 
This third one he didn't demonstrate because they were nowhere close to the Nile River. They're around the region of Mount Sinai. The Nile River doesn't run by Mount Sinai, but God tells him, God predicts to him, you can perform this third sign when you're back among the sands of Egypt. You just take a cup of water from the Nile River, you pour it out on the sand, and guess what? That water will turn to blood. And Moses knew exactly what this sign meant. You see, because for the Egyptian culture, for Egyptian society, the Nile River was everything. The Nile River was life. It was the Nile River and the water of the Nile River that provided their economy. It was their sustenance. It was their food. It was their livelihood. As you go in Egypt, they would call the the land that was close to the Nile River the black land. Why? Because it was so productive. It was so rich. It was so ripe for production of crops. As you move away from the Nile River, they would call that land the Red Land. Nothing grows in the Red Land. It's all dead. You can't grow crops. Further, the Nile River was where they would catch fish. So their entire economy as a people was based on the Nile River. Further, because of that, the ancient Egyptians worshipped the Nile River. They saw the Nile River as the father of, of all economy, and the mother of life. And so God says, snake, I'm going to impact their power. Leprosy, I'm going to impact their health. Nile River, I'm going to impact their economy. You see, if the entire Nile River turns to blood, guess what? You can't drink it. Blood equates to death. I'm going to destroy their economy. But Moses says, the people won't listen to me. They won't believe me. They won't hearken to my voice. And God says, I got three three miracles that I'm going to give you so they'll listen to you that will prove that you were sent from God. And each of these are really foreshadowings of what God's going to do in the upcoming chapters as we'll study. Well, after God profoundly answers this first excuse that Moses raises, the excuse of his own skepticism and the skepticism he sees in the people, he raises this second excuse. Number two, the speech of his mouth. Here's excuse number two, God. Look at verse 10. But Moses said to the Lord, O my Lord, I am not eloquent, either in the past or since you have spoken to your servant, but I am slow of speech and of tongue. Now, what does this mean? Does this mean that Moses was not a good public speaker? Perhaps. Does it mean that he had a stuttering problem? Perhaps. We don't know. But regardless, this is excuse number two. I can't speak well. I don't talk very well. And as I read this text, particularly within the context, I looked at it and I said, so what? (laughs) So what if you can't speak well? God's just demonstrated three powerful and profound miracles that he said will be convincing proofs that you've been sent from God. Your capacity, your eloquence to speak is a non-issue. The power of God is going to be displayed. There's a little bit of a football game happening tonight. Is anybody aware of that? Super Bowl. So if if you're a football fan, you'll likely watch the Super Bowl. And what happens at the end of the Super Bowl? Here's what's going to happen. Um, Patrick Mahomes is going to lift up the Super Bowl trophy. <laughs> and Taylor Swift is going to be in the box. Yay! I almost want to not watch because of that. Am I right? <laughs> now, after he lifts up the Super Bowl trophy, guess what's going to happen? The reporter is going to put a microphone in his face. And you could go ahead and write the speech because it's the same speech every time. These Super Bowl champions or World Series champions or whatever athletes, they're not the most articulate, right? (laughs) They're not the most eloquent communicators. But if you're a football fan, guess what? You'll watch the interview. You'll listen to the coach. It's a real team win here. We're thankful for everybody's contribution. It's the same thing every time. The reason you'll listen to the interview is not because you think they're going to have some kind of mind-blowing eloquence that's going to just inspire you. The reason you'll listen to the interview is because of what they just did on the field. 
They just put forward an incredible athletic performance. Moses, it doesn't matter how eloquent you are. They're going to listen to you because of what I'm going to do on the field, because of the power I'm going to present in my miraculous signs and wonders. Moses, the people will not listen. The elders will not listen. You're right. Pharaoh won't even listen because of how good you can string together words and phrases. They will listen because I turned a stick into a snake, because I turned the Nile River into blood. Your ability to form coherent sentences is not why they're going to listen. But notice what God's answer is to Moses' second excuse. God's answer is profound words. Verse 11 and 12. Then Yahweh, the Lord, said to him, Who has made man's mouth? Who makes him mute or deaf or seeing or blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now, therefore, go, and I will be with your mouth and teach you what you shall speak. Now, in the previous chapter, we saw how God promised when Moses raised the question, who am I? God says, I'll tell you who you are. You're the guy who's going to have my presence. And now he expands on that and makes it a little more detail here. He says, I'll tell you who you are as far as you're speaking. You're the guy who I'm going to be with your mouth. I'm going to touch what you say. Think about this, and again, I can somewhat identify with Moses on this. I can sometimes think, you know, I struggle with getting what's here to here. Anybody with me on that? I can have these thoughts rumbling around in my head, but man, getting them from here to here, that's why I use a manuscript, because it takes me hours to think through what I need to get from here to here. I can kind of identify with Moses. I may not be that articulate, I may not have that capacity. And you may feel that way sometimes too. You may be the type of a Christian who says, you know, I'm more of a behind-the-scenes type Christian. I'll work behind the scenes and I'll do this and that, but please don't ask me to speak. Please don't ask me to talk. Please don't ask me to share anything about your faith. Last time I checked, the Great Commission was for every Christian. You may not think that you have much speaking ability, but if you're a believer in Jesus, God has called you to speak. It may not be on a platform behind a pulpit. It may not be teaching a small group class or Bible study. If you are a Christian, you are called to testify of the goodness of God, to proclaim the gospel. We can be just like Moses. We can offer up these excuses. They won't believe me. They won't listen to me. Somebody else needs to go who's a much better talker. I have difficulty getting all my facts straight. I can't answer their skepticisms. My tongue gets tied in knots. But the application for us today is this. God is so much bigger than your inability to speak. He's so much bigger than your personal capacity. You see, because even as 21st century believers, we have something that is worlds beyond even what Moses had. You have something that is of so much greater value and convincing power than even the miracles that Moses was to demonstrate. You know what you have? The gospel. Notice what Paul said in Romans 1.16. For I... I am not ashamed of the gospel. For it, not my eloquence, not my education, not how well I can articulate ideas, it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. We have something that is so much more powerful than signs and wonders. You know what miracles are? Miracles are a temporary bending of the natural law. But what happens after the miracle bends the natural law? It goes back to being the natural law. It doesn't affect anything long term. A sign, a wonder, we could ask for those things. God, give me miracles. Listen, they're temporary in their effect. But the gospel is eternal. You speak the truth about Jesus. 
His death, burial, and resurrection, friend, you've got something so much more powerful than any miracle could ever be. It carries more punch. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation. Friend, it doesn't really matter how articulate you are. If you can just share the simplicity of who Jesus is and what Jesus has done, that is the power of God and salvation. So Moses has raised these two excuses why he's not the guy for the job. And God has answered each of those excuses in a profound and straightforward way. And so Moses then comes to the third excuse. And I think this one is probably the most honest excuse from his heart. Number three, the struggle of his motivation. Verse 13, but he, Moses, said, oh, my Lord, please send someone else. The reason Moses didn't want to go is he didn't want to go. He just didn't want to go. He just didn't want to do it. God, just send somebody, anybody else. Now, those other excuses may have been valid on some level, but I think, personal opinion, they were kind of a smokescreen to just cover up this third excuse. He just didn't want to do it. It's like you may have experienced something like this when somebody maybe you're not really too keen on, you just kind of don't click with, comes to you and says, hey, we should hang out sometime. Yeah, we should do that. How about tomorrow? Oh, tomorrow. My kids got this thing at school I told them I'd go to. How about Tuesday? Tuesday. Well, I would Tuesday, but, you know, there's this optional thing at work, and you know our boss. Uh, optional really means he expects you to be there. How about Wednesday? Wednesday. Oh, that's church night. Now, you never come to church on Wednesday, but you use that as an excuse. Thursday. Thursday. Well, that's the night I always organize my sock drawer. We come up with all these excuses when we don't really want to do something that we don't want to do. Moses, go to the people and speak for me. What's the bottom line motivation? Would you just send somebody else? I just don't want to go. We can become masters of throwing up all these excuses for not doing something we really just don't want to do. And I don't know, maybe God is answering all of Moses' other objections and excuses because he wants to dig down to this foundational excuse, the underlying issue, he just doesn't want to do it. I want you to notice particularly God's answer to this third excuse. God's answer is to provide a partner in ministry. A partner in ministry. God's answer is to inform him he's not going to be alone. I'm going to give you not just me, but I'm going to give you another person. And not just another person, your own flesh and blood, your brother Aaron will be your partner in ministry. But now before he tells him that, it's quite clear from the text God is angry with Moses' unwillingness to obey because of his lack of faith. Look at verse 14 through 17. Then the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses, and he said, Is there not Aaron, your brother, the Levite? I know that he can speak well. Behold, he is coming out to meet you, and when he sees you, he will be glad in his heart. You shall speak to him and put the words in his mouth, and I will be with your mouth and with his mouth and will teach you both what to do. He shall speak for you to the people, and he shall be your mouth, and you shall be as God to him. And take in your hand this staff, here's the tra transition of the staff coming, with which you shall do the signs. This is going to become the staff of God. Now, who knows how long it's been since Moses has seen his brother Aaron. It could have been 40 years separated from his brother for 40 years. And God answers this final objection by saying, guess what? I'm going to give somebody to come alongside you. I'm going to give you a partner in ministry. Aaron is going to assist you. And I can tell you from personal experience, when there have been times I wanted to throw in the towel, when there have been times I've wanted to quit, when there have been times I did not want to obey, I wanted to turn tail and run in the opposite direction, God has brought person after person after person into my life who will hold me up, who will encourage, who will inspire, who will hold me accountable, who will correct. 
thankful for the people that God brings into our lives to propel us forward in the fight for the gospel. And he'll give you those too. All of Moses' excuses have been graciously answered by God. What a gracious God we have, amen? Now, in the remaining time we have together, I'm going to do a quick flyover of the rest of the chapter so we can see what happens from here. How we get to verse 31, where we read at the beginning, the people believed. How did we get to that point? Moses has offered these excuses. God's answered every excuse. How do we get to the end of the chapter? Look with me in your Bible, beginning in verse 18. This is going to be a quick flyover. I'll make a few observations as we go through. Verse 18. Moses went back to Jethro, his father-in-law, and said to him, please let me go back to my brothers in Egypt to see whether they are still alive. And Jethro said to Moses, go in peace. That's a grace gift. Verse 19, and the Lord said to Moses and Midian, go back to Egypt for all the men who were seeking your life are dead. So Moses took his wife and his sons and had them ride on a donkey and went back to the land of Egypt. And Moses took the staff of God in his hand, transformed stick right there. Just one comment. I find it interesting that God even answers an excuse that Moses didn't voice. Moses surely remembered, last time I was in Egypt, there was a whole posse of people trying to kill me. Pharaoh had put out a wanted poster for my life. I was as good as dead. And God answers even the concerns that may have been just in Moses' mind and heart. Hey, Moses, by the way, just so you know, to comfort you a little bit, even the people that were seeking your life, they're all dead. They're gone. Verse 21, and the Lord said to Moses, when you go back to Egypt, see that you do before Pharaoh all the miracles that I've put in your power, but I will harden his heart so that he will not let the people go. Then you shall say to Pharaoh, thus says the Lord, Israel is my firstborn son, and I say to you, let my son go that he may serve me. If you refuse to let him go, behold, I will kill your f- firstborn son. So God tells Moses ahead of time, Pharaoh's not going to let you go. He's going to resist. He's going to say no again and again and again and again. So you tell Pharaoh, you don't let my firstborn son go. I'm going to kill your firstborn son. Now, this is royal language. This is monarchical language. By that I mean the firstborn son is the descendant of the king. He is the successor to the throne. And God promises Pharaoh, the king over Egypt, you don't let my people go, the one who is to succeed you on the throne, this son that you put all your hope in to follow your reign, I'm gonna kill him. And this is actually a portent, a prefiguring of the 10th plague when in fact, the firstborn son of Pharaoh and every other Egyptian is killed. Let's keep reading verse 24. At a lodging place on the way, the Lord met him, this is Moses, and sought to put him to death. What? What's happening? Then Zipporah, that's his wife, took a flint and cut off her son's foreskin and touched Moses' feet with it and said, surely you are a bridegroom of blood to me. So he let him alone. It was then that she said, a bridegroom of blood because of the circumcision. Teenage boys love this passage. What is going on here, right? This is wacko. God's going to now kill Moses? And Zipporah comes in and circumcises her 40-year-old adult male son? What? (laughs) And then puts the blood on Moses' feet? Why would God want to kill Moses? Moses. Why is he seeking his life? The best we can understand is this. And I think the simplest explanation is Moses' son was a descendant of Abraham. Every male descendant of Abraham was to be circumcised as a sign of the covenant. And here's Moses, this good Jew, who himself was circumcised on the eighth day. He has a son who is not circumcised. He's going back to the covenant people of Israel in bondage in Egypt saying, hey, you you all obey my voice when he himself had not obeyed the voice of God. God says hypocrisy is worthy of death. Disobedience is worse than witchcraft. 
you don't obey the law of God, you shall surely die. And his loving wife saved his life. I can tell you this is not the first time that a preacher's wife saved the life of her husband. (laughs) I can testify to that truth because of her own obedience in spite of her husband's disobedience. In fact, look at this next slide. The principle here is this. We can't say to people, obey God, when there's a glaring demonstration of disobedience in our own lives. You can't. If there's a glaring disobedience in your own life, you can't come to other people and say, you need to obey God. What hypocrisy, inconsistency, and according to God, it's worthy of death. But let's keep reading verse 27. The Lord said to Aaron, go into the wilderness to meet Moses. So he went and met him at the mountain of God and kissed him. And Moses told Aaron all the words of the Lord with which he had sent him to speak and all the signs that he had commanded him to do. To do. Then Moses and Aaron went and gathered together all the elders of the people of Israel. Aaron spoke all the words that the Lord had spoken to Moses and did the signs in the sight of the people. So Moses and Aaron, these two brothers, they meet up. Meet up. Moses fills them in. Here's what's been going on in my life. I don't know about you. Here's what God's called me to do. You're to be my mouthpiece. You're to take the message to the children of Israel with me and perform the signs. And that brings us to the finale. It brings us to the ultimate point of the passage that I showed you at the beginning, the first line of verse 31. Look at it again with me. And the people believed what Moses thought would never happen. The people believed. Why? When they heard that the Lord had visited the people of Israel and that he had seen their affliction, their response, they bowed their heads and worshiped. The people believed. Why? Two things. They heard. Number one, the Lord has visited. Number two, he's seen our affliction. I told you last week that the book of Exodus, the story of the real true story of these actual events that occurred in real history, this book of Exodus is ultimately not about this Exodus. The book of Exodus is not ultimately about the deliverance of the Hebrew people from the Egyptian captivity. The whole point of the book of Exodus is to point forward to another deliverance. The whole point of the miracles that were performed and the rescue from oppression and affliction is to point to another rescue from oppression and affliction. This is such a beautiful picture and foreshadowing of the gospel of Jesus. You see, because just like them, the second person of the Trinity who spoke from the burning bush saw their affliction, saw their slavery. Friend, he sees your affliction. Jesus sees your slavery. And just like them, he came and visited them. Do you know that Jesus has come and visited us? He took on human flesh. He was incarnated. He walked around as a human being just like you and I. The Bible says in Hebrews, he was tempted in every way we have been tempted, yet he never sinned. And because the wages of sin is death, he did not deserve to die. But Jesus, out of love and grace for you, provided the blood payment for you through his death on the cross. He was buried. For three days he was in that grave, and on the third day he was resurrected from the dead by the very power of God. He has seen our affliction, and he has visited us. And here's the only appropriate response to this good news. Repent and believe the gospel. Repent and believe the gospel. They see the Israelites, and they hear of the heart of God for them. God has actually seen our affliction, and he's visited us to rescue us. And how did they respond? They bowed their heads and worshiped God. And that's an appropriate response. Bowing your head is an act of contrition. 
Call it repentance. Worshiping God is an act of faith and belief in his promises. And here's the big application for us as we close. Friend, as we speak the word of God, don't try to predict what's going to happen. Don't try to predict the responses. Remember, the word of God is the word of God. Let it do the work. It is, by definition, powerful. And if we somehow start relying on our own strength and our own eloquence, our own influence, we will, just like Moses, doubt everything. We'll throw up all these excuses. Simply speak the word of God. Because here's the deal. If by some way I had the power of persuasion to convince someone to pray some prayer or to raise a hand at the end of a service or to fill out some decision card, if I had in my own powers of eloquence and persuasion the capacity to convince someone to do those things, guess how much assurance is in that? None. But if the God of the universe sees your affliction and the God of the universe through his spirit comes down to your heart and boom, boom, performs life-transforming surgery on your heart, if the God of the universe rescues you from the domain of darkness and transfers you supernaturally into the kingdom of his beloved son, so much so that you cry out to God in belief and worship. How much assurance is in that? Everything. Friend, if you believe because your mama believed, no assurance. But if you believe because the power of God has come upon you and rescued you from darkness to light, from death to life, friends, you can walk out of here knowing God has saved me. God has saved me. God does the work. We simply speak the good news and trust him to do it. And that leads to my last thought. We obey God's command to speak and trust God's power to save.